Hello, everybody. Welcome to the new camper meeting. Um, if you could all please mute your oh um, microphones. Um, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Just waiting for everyone to get joined here. All right. All right. Well, once again, welcome everybody. Um, I'll keep admitting folks that join, but it's a little after 6.30 now, so we'll get started just to honor everybody's time tonight. Um, we're sure glad that you're all here. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your evening to hear about CAMP and its benefits. Um, my name is Catherine. I work at Base Camp uh, and with community programs, but I've worked at Tomahawk and Filippo and Stearns in the past. Um, and I'm just going to be kind of moderating the chat. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat um, and we will either get them into kind of some of our bullet points or we'll do them at the end. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Alex, our Tomahawk director and our ManyPoint director, and they will introduce our panel um, and we'll get going. I suppose I'll kick it off. Um, just introduce myself and then I'll hand it over to Brian. Uh, my name is Alex Farrell. I'm the Many Point Scout Camp Director. Um, this is going to be my 10th year working at Many Point. I spent um, eight years as a seasonal staff member before hopping over um, to the professional scouting side. And um, I've also worked um, a lot of our other programs. I've worked the Northwind program and I've helped out with a lot of our fall day camp, polar cubs, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm really excited about tonight and I'm really excited to hopefully um, get some of y'all more interested in camp. Brian? Great. Thanks, Alex. My name is Brian Halloran. I'm the Tomahawk director. I've been in that role for uh, 10 full summers now, and I'm a registered adult leader in Troop 324 out of Belle Plaine. Um, I'm pretty active with my nephews down in that unit um, and uh, oversee our winter camping programs. But uh, Tomahawk summer camp is my is my real passion, working with our summer camps. So, um Tonight we'll be talking about camp and one of the greatest things about camp is this sort of magic that happens with the coordination between local uh, unit leaders and volunteers at the local level that are involved in those troops and our camp staff. Our camp staff provide the program and the unit leaders provide a level of familiarity in a camp setting um, that uh, those two things combined together create this magical place that is Many Point and Tomahawk Scout Camp. Yeah, and overall, the overall intention for this meeting um, is for families that are not signed up for this summer quite yet. Um, and if you are one of those families, feel free to still stick around. Um, there are definitely some information that you can learn and take away and help educate the other families. Um, and our, our overall hope is to change your mind for this summer. If you aren't registered yet or if you know a scout um, who isn't registered yet that would be interested in coming to camp, um, that's what we're here for. We're here to hopefully get you that information and get you everything you need to feel comfortable and safe on sending your scout to camp this summer. And tonight we've assembled a, an expert panel of different adult leaders that have their foot both in the scouting world and, uh, and, and also just kind of experts in being scout leaders, bringing kids to camp. They've experienced a lot of different uh, issues over the years that have arised and they've solved a lot of those and they've seen a lot of the benefits that scout camp uh, can provide. So we'll go through our experienced uh, group of panelists here and uh, have them introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about uh, their background and experience in scouting. And uh, we'll start off with Myron Jacobson. He's a assistant scout master for Troop 5. So Myron, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Myron Jacobson. I'm an assistant scout master with Troop 5 in Woodbury, Minnesota. And uh, if I had two things to tell you about my experience at Tomahawk, first one would be that this will be my 46th summer there. I was a camper there for the first time in 1978. 
I uh, worked there for a little more than a decade. And uh, 46 years later, after I had what I told myself my first year, I would never go back. Here, here I am. But more than that, um, my troop goes up for two weeks. Um, we have 87 scouts registered. Currently, we have 73 of them that are going to be going to camp. And all 14 of our new scouts are signed up for camp. So uh, I guess those are my credentials. Fantastic. Renee, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your favorite things about camp. Hello, everyone. I'm Renee. I am a scoutmaster of Girl Troop 7446 in Egan. I've been taking the girls up now since they found it in 2019, so about five years. And I would say my favorite thing about camp is the, just the transformation in the kids. They go up and they don't know what they're expecting. And you see them like persevere for that whole week. And it's absolutely amazing to watch as a leader. And Renee, you go to both properties, correct? Yep, we are. We are going to both properties. We go, we do, we'll spend a week at Tomahawk as well this year. So, um, yep, we're going to be busy this summer. So awesome. Getting the best of both worlds. And yes. uh, speaking of both worlds, Mike McCuller has a, a background in, in youth development with a, you know, working as an administrator for a school, as well as being on camp staff and an active uh, member in uh, local scout units. So Mike, tell us a little bit about you and your favorite things about camp. Thanks, Brian. My name is Mike McCuller. I'm the campwide program director up at Many Point Scout Camp. This will be my 17th summer on staff up at Many Point, so I love going back every year, obviously. Um, I recently retired from the St. Paul Public Schools as a teacher and principal, so I get to work with kids all year round, uh, mostly at the middle school level, middle school and high school level. Um, the reason that uh, I keep going back to camp and I see a lot of growth in the scouts that I work with um, is that the connections that they really make with the other scouts in the troop, the connections they make with the staff and the new experiences that they have. Probably my biggest credential for this meeting is I'm also a dad. Um, my son, Matthew, is an Eagle Scout, just graduated from the University of Minnesota. My daughter, Madeline, uh, is a chemical engineer, graduated from Iowa State University. And so I worked with them on what it is like to go to camp for the first time. Uh, and so uh, obviously I certainly understand where you're at right now and it's a great experience. And even though uh, there's a little bit of apprehensive, they're gonna have a great time at camp and look back at these uh, experiences for the rest of their lives. Nice. All right, well, we'll start off with some of the questions that we, we anticipated everybody asking and feel free to put more questions into the chat, like Catherine said, and we'll answer those throughout the, the rest of the meeting here. But Renee, uh, if you could start us off with this question, and we'll let our other panelists also chime in on it as well, but we'll have you start. What's a typical day at camp like for uh, young scouts? What are they, what can they expect? Well, a typical day, um, they're going to, you know, rise and shine, right out and bushy-tailed, right? Uh, they're going to go off and explore. They're going to learn some things with their merit badges, or they're going to be taking first class adventure, or some of our older kids get to do the ATVs and things like that. So they get to have all these new experiences throughout the day, and they'll come back at lunch and tell us about it. And then the afternoon, they get to kind of do some fun activities together, whether it's on the aqua tramp or on the sailboats or some other activities that they have they have picked out for the week. And then they kind of wind down in the evening and get ready to do it all over again for the next five days, so. Nice. Uh, well, could one of our panelists tell us a little bit about the first class adventure? Renee, you had mentioned that. Um, uh, I think we call it Brown Sea at Tomahawk, but I think they're very similar programs. Mike, do you wanna walk us through what that program is designed for? Sure, let me chime in with that. And again, for our first year scouts, we have um, from the education world, a curriculum that's developmentally appropriate and it's specially designed for our first year scouts. We want them to achieve some advancement so that they get some recognition for being at camp. Um, we see that scouts that attend camp, um, most of them are able to easily become first class scouts within the first year, which is a benchmark in scouting and they're able to get some of that recognition, but they have staff that are specially trained and specially activities that are specially designed just to work with first year scouts. So a lot of time there's some apprehensive uh, apprehension about them work being with bigger kids and stuff like that. 
Our first class adventure or a Broncy program, they're with first year scouts and we involve the adult leaders from the troop as uh, assisting with some of that instruction. But our staff is specially trained and sp doing specially designed activities just for those first year scouts so that they really uh, get a s sense of accomplishment. During the troop activity times, they are able to do some of those fun activities and do the, some of those bonding activities, whether it's a canoe trip or aqua tramps or archery or rifle uh, with their troops. So they're able to work with their troop and get to know their troop members better. And then in the evening, there's some open activity time. So it gets from a lot structured in the morning where they're working on these first class adventure or Brown Sea requirements. In the afternoon, they're doing more fun activities as a troop. And then they actually get a chance to do things that they want to do. So some of our kids really want to be at the beach all the time. They want to sail boats. Other kids want to be at the climbing tower. Other kids are really into nature. And so that's a time where they can, with a buddy, um, go explore some of those areas and do something that really interests them. So even though camp is a fairly structured environment, there's opportunities for them to pursue their individual passions as well. Awesome. So it sounds like the morning is kind of based on the individual for advancement. Uh, that's very, very structured. The afternoon is for the troop to participate together. And the evening is kind of for them and a buddy or them and their patrol to go off and explore areas that they're especially interested in. Right. Um, Myron, anything you'd add to kind of the typical day to a, a troop schedule? No, I think one of the most important things that it's having on are, are probably not the things that are on the schedule. Uh, um, one of the, I mean, the biggest thing that's happening at scout camp is a scout is getting more hours of scouting in a week at summer camp than an entire year of troop meetings. And so the real magic that's going on is the bonding that is happening uh, with that new scout patrol. And, uh, you know, sometimes when I hear a parent that has a scout who is later dropping out of scouting, they'll say, well, you know, he's behind an advancement, or at least he thinks he is. And he's, he's just not really you know, bonding with the, the folks in the patrol. And I'll think back and think, yeah, he didn't get to summer camp that first year. And the rest of his patrol just cemented. And he feels like he's behind because that, uh, that first year camper program is really designed to get them kickstarted uh, on advancement. So although we know that there really is not not a falling behind, they think there is. And so it kind of comes back to Hana, but the real magic is the bonding that happens with his patrols and getting to know each other. Renee, what kind of sort of relationship building and bonding have you seen, especially with first year campers mm -hmm. in your troop? Well, I think you see a lot of like encouragement. Um, like Myron said, it really is where they start really building those friendships because they're some are fairly fresh to crossing over. So you kind of see that they tackle the challenges together. They kind of encourage each other. They kind of work through whatever they're going through as a patrol, but they really are just, it's to just to see that development in them and that bonding in that, that week is amazing to see. Yeah. I know that when we, we look at the brochure to come to camp, we see pictures of the aqua trampoline and riding horses and, and shooting bows and arrows and, uh, and hanging out with a group. And so you see that and you think, yeah, camp is going to be a lot of fun. But I'm sure that a lot of the the, the parents and, and leaders that are on tonight's meeting, you're you're here because you there's an anxiety that is felt by by parents or by your youth. And they're worried about going to camp. Um, you know, that's normal. And so what are some ways, uh, Myron, what are some ways that families can ease that anxiety in going to camp? What are some steps that we can tackle uh, that anxiety and uh, uh, and get get beyond that, so that we can focus on having fun at camp. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of uh, evidence, and uh, there's a lot of folks that have been studying the the issue or the subject of homesickness. And so, us as scout leaders, many of the things that we read about, uh, yeah, that's absolutely. Um, we can we can give you anecdotal evidence till the cows come home. There is universally a number of do's and don'ts that we try to instill in in uh, scout troops when they're coming to camp, and it's uh, it's kind of it's pretty simple. Um, focus on how much fun they're going to be having at camp. Um, don't you know? Uh, 
uh, don't tell them how much, well, let me get to the don'ts at the end. Let me do the do's first. So some of them are just focusing on the fun. Tell them that it's natural. This is the acknowledging. It's okay. You're going to miss your parents. I get it. You're going to be away from home. We all have those feelings. They're perfectly normal. There are some things that we do with scouts when they get to camp. Um, so we, we call these coping strategies, um, keeping a positive attitude on having fun. Uh, we uh, talk with the counselors, talk with the adult leaders in your troop, talk with their tent mate. Most scouts will have a tent mate, so there's someone there that's with them. Um, we can talk about uh, telling parents to encourage them to keep a journal of their, you know, write things down, good old fashioned writing. So Michael loved that, you know, that they're not texting, they're writing, including postcards home. So we sell postcards in the trading post. It's probably the only time parents ever get a postcard from their kid uh, going off to summer camp. That is timeless and it hasn't changed. Uh, we as leaders uh, will keep them busy. It's the biggest uh, ingredient is lots of activities. Um, parents can be, uh, as they're getting ready to go off to camp, can be asking them, you know, what are all the fun things you're looking forward to doing? You know, I, I know you talked about wanting to do this particular activity. Um, uh, keeping a, a calendar that they can be marking off the days. Uh, one of the things we also notice is really helpful as a parent, because we know we want to make sure that they're prepared for camp is helping them pack for camp. So go, you know, making it a thing that you do together with your, with your child where you're uh, all right, have you got your rain gear? You know, all right, you are set in case it rains. So helping them pack, it's okay to include what I call the comfort items. Uh, my son packed his blankie uh, had the first time he went to camp and he was glad he did it. Um, so comfort items, uh, tents can be dark at night. Uh, they, there are a number of little small battery operated nightlights that I use a nightlight in my tent because it's black as a coal mine in there. And I, I wanna be able to see things. So um, just lots of reassurances as they're getting ready. Letting them know how proud you're gonna be about their independence and how excited you are about their accomplishments. And you can't wait for them to tell you all that when they come home. Um, I usually find it's best if you were upfront with a scout and say, you know, uh, don't, if they ask, tell them that no, there aren't any phone calls and no, I'm not coming up to get you early. So let's just put that away and put that thought out of your mind. Um, so those are some of the basics. Um, uh, tell them that, you know, uh, are some of the things that I said I was going to mention the don'ts. So don't tell them how sad or, or, or the anxiety that you have. And parents, it is perfectly natural for you to miss your kid. Uh, and we're all in the same boat because uh, every camper that is their first year, fifth grade, going into sixth, this is probably the first time that they have ever been away from mom and dad for a week. And that's perfectly natural. Uh, they're going to get over it. They're going to get through it. They are going to have the most memorable week of their life. Um, and that's the, that's the real message in all this is um, when I would talk to parents, uh, this is what I'm going to end with, is um, I'll tell them, you know, all the great works of literature that involve an adventure, and you can just start thinking of the books, Treasure Island, uh, The Hunger Games, uh, Peter Pan, uh, you name Star Wars. If you're going to have a bona fide adventure, mom and dad can't be there. Um, you got to get rid of the parents. And uh, I, I always find that interesting when I'm seeing any youth story, the, the magic tree house that, that, that involves kids having an adventure, the parents just can't be around. And so you're going to have to deal with some of those things where, yeah, I'm going to miss them but it's going to be a wonderful reunion. We like to say there are, there are more tears at the end of camp when they come home than there are at the beginning as they're saying goodbye. Nice. Yeah. And building on, building on what Myron was saying, the great thing about scout camp and uh, summer camp is that they're coming up to summer camp with the troop so that they're scouts that they already know. They might've just joined the troop, but they are at least in the patrol they're with adult leaders that know them. And many point is proud that we're one of the first scout camps in the country that uh, scouts actually came up as troops rather than individuals. Prior to that, early in the scouting career, um, 
scouts would come up just like they would go to a YMCA camp. They would just sign up and go as individuals and be put into troops. Whereas at many point in Tomahawk, the scouts come up with scouts that they know, with their friends, with leaders that know them. And so there's certainly that magic and that newness and certainly new experiences, but there's that comfort of being with somebody from home, with somebody from their own troop that they know that they've met, that they're starting to go through scouting with, as well as adult leaders that know what those needs are. We all are different and we all have different uh, talents, abilities, and needs. And if the adult leaders know those things in advance, some kids, um, they have certain food things that they like. Some kids have certain behavior things that are important for them. And the adult leaders being at camp and really working with the camp staff, our job is to provide an incredible program that's going to, like Myron says, keep the kids busy all day long so they don't even think about home. But the adult leaders are there as providing that kind of continuity and that safety net so that they're there and they have communication with the parent. And so that there's we're, we're working together with the adult leaders to provide not only a safe environment for the kids, but also uh, an extremely fun environment for the kids. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Myron. And all of that kind of leads into this this next question of we we just got done talking about the anxiousness that comes from camp. And one of the things I'm sure Myron and Renee, you have both dealt with is that that dreaded phone call home. Um, there's always a point where scouts say, can I call my mom and dad? And what are what are ways that you help help with that situation? Renee, if you want to share some, maybe if you have a story. You know, we're pretty upfront with the scouts that we we really don't want them to call home because we know once they call home and they hear mom or dad's voice, they want to go home. Um, so we really kind of try to and just engage them. We do talk to the camp staff and the camp counselors for the scouts that are really kind of hitting that wall, usually typically Wednesday night, Thursday, where they're just really homesick. So, so far, we've been pretty lucky to avoid a phone call home and we, we kind of help the scout work through their emotions and we know, you know, we're tired, they're tired by Wednesday, Thursday. And, and so they just miss mom and dad, but we, we pull in the resources from the camps to help and um, make sure that scout, that scout um, is still feeling comfortable and having fun. And usually that's just what it just, they need a little, a little oomph and a little push and they're good to, you know, finish the last couple of days or we say there's two more sleeps and then we're going to be, on, you know, heading home. So, but typically we just let them know that we don't call home unless there's an emergency and you know we do post things in our facebook group so the parents can see what the kids are doing so that they're not trying to reach out to the, the scouts too so we try to keep that line of communication open with the families as well yeah myron do you have anything to add to that well i really want to just uh, catapult off something renee said which is the importance of facebook um, you know, in the, the Boy Scouts, as like every other company, we recognize the power that Facebook has with moms. Uh, the typical mom visits about seven or eight times a day. And uh, we post quite heavily on our troop Facebook page, uh, letting mom and dad back home know that everybody's fine. We're, we're all fine. Um, I like to say, you know, particularly after a thunderstorm the night before when we're at breakfast the next morning, I'll, I'll say, all right, lots of smiles. We need to have a proof of life for mom and dad back home so that the scoutmaster isn't getting lots of calls. Boy, we had a lot of thunderstorms in the Twin Cities. You know, we're all fine. It's all good. Um, anyway, uh, it, I, I would like to say that uh, in terms of helping kids get through the week, um, it, it, gradual steps, gradual steps, you know, that first day in camp, we're like, well, we just got here the next day. Hey, we just arrived yesterday. Uh, the next day it's like, tomorrow's the halfway point. Okay. You'll be closer to going home than staying here. You know, the next day you've only got two nights left in camp. I mean, this is like a weekend camp out the next day you're going home tomorrow. It goes very quickly. Um, and then before they know it, camp is over. And that kid who, who did not want to go, who wanted to go home, now they don't want to leave. Um, so it's, it's funny that way. Um, so it, keeping them busy uh, is, is absolutely the best thing. And, and it's also saying for both the parents and the scouts, I get it. It's, it's okay. We miss home. Um, sometimes, you know, some will say, Myron, what's your, what's your favorite thing about a week at summer camp? And, going home, 
you know, it's, it's, it's okay to want to be, you know, missing home. That's part of, uh, that's what makes home home. So just acknowledging those things. Perfect. And Mike, you and I, I mean, we've both been in the position we've been, we deal with training our staff on these types of conversations and what, what types of things do we do? Do we tell our staff when a situation like this comes up, what, sh what should they be doing? Again, we work real closely with the adult leader because every kid is different and we want to meet the needs of every kid where they are. Again, like Myron was saying, we want to keep the, stu the uh, scouts as active as possible and doing activities, but sometimes they just need a time out because they are going and going so strong and doing so many things and sometimes staying up in their tents, like Myron was saying with their flashlights, you know, playing cards or doing whatever um, before they go to bed. So uh, sometimes they just need a time out and sometimes they need a time to talk to uh, either a camp staff member or at many point at Tomahawk as well. We're fortunate to have camp chaplains on hand. Ours is Father Tom, a Catholic priest who's been on the camp staff for 30 years. So he's worked with a lot of kids that were homesick. And um, so we have a number of different strategies, kind of a progressive level of strategies as far as working with kids that, that are uh, a little bit homesick. But again, the, the most important thing is to keep the, we keep the kids busy. We have them make a connection with the other scouts in the troop, as well as a connection with the staff, which they're gonna uh, certainly make and a connection with uh, scouts that they're gonna meet from different troops. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I know Myron, you you kind of touched on this topic a little bit earlier this evening, but overall we, we, we have seen that scouts who do go to camp tend to stay in camp. Um, They've done plenty of studies on it. They've pulled plenty of people on it. And it's that's the result. If you go to camp, you stay into camp, whether it's the our cub camps or it's our um, long-term scouts BSA camps. Um, so between Myron and Renee, what, ha what have we seen for those scouts who don't make it to camp? I know, Myron, you already touched on it a little bit. Um, well, the first thing is they're, they're not bonding. And if they're not bonding, they're not making friends with the other scouts in the troop. And that, that's really the most thing, the most important thing, because, you know, it's all about the relationships. Why does this, why does a forget they're a scout. Why does a kid do anything? I, I like the kids on my soccer team. I like the kids that are in my choir. I like the kids in band. It's those relationships and scouting is no different. So it's important that you make those relationships and not miss out on those relationships. Um, I wanted to say something uh, about cell phones too, because I'm just think they're evil. But um, I was having a conversation with a scout and I said, what was your greatest camp out? And he says, well, it wasn't here. I was with another group and we went to the Boundary Waters and I was like, oh, the Boundary Waters. That sounds great. You, I, so that was your favorite camp out. Yeah, you know, it rained and our, our tents collapsed and the, the bear got into our food. And and I was just thinking, wow, and this is your favorite camp out. And he goes, yeah, because we figured it out. And it, and, I, and he was going on and he it was memorable. It was exciting. It was an adventure. He was fine. Um, and then I was just thinking, well, what if I could have called your mom or you could have called your mom and she would have come and got you? You never would have had that adventure. And, and the, anyway, I just think about that. Um, we, we know that the cell phone is not the answer because uh, as Renee said, if, you, if a scout talks to a parent, the waterworks just start and it just and on both sides. Anyway, th this is, I almost want to say, it's that rite of passage of independence that is, that is necessary. Uh, parents don't think that their kid can do it. They can. They do. Uh, that's one thing that bears out through through the numbers. Um, I've I've seen scouts leave camp and then not return. I I can't think of an instance where scouts have had a bad week at camp and decided that they were going to leave scouting. That you know that just didn't. I just I just haven't seen that at all my time. So it's it's really important to just go to camp. It's a leap of faith. It will be fine. Um, one of the, a leader that I really admire recently told me that, you know, they're going to be uncomfortable, but uncomfortable is not the same thing as not being safe. Perfect. Yeah. Renee, do you have something to share about your friend, your scouts that don't like go to camp? 
it, it really is a bonding time. It really is a time that they get to get to know, you know, the other kids, the other adult leaders as well. Um, yes, there's advancement and we can always, you know, work around, but they'll see their friends kind of leapfrog a little bit ahead of them. Um, but we, uh, it's just really the friendships. That's what camp is. It's, it's about building those friendships. Perfect. Well, thank you for that, both of you. And um, Mike, do you have any experience and have anything to add to that one? No, I just wanted to add to that. Kids are going to go through transitions their whole life. And um, again, as a middle school teacher and principal, we had, uh, you know, about 300 new sixth graders come every year. And again, it's the same thing. I mean, if and parents know that kids, when they go to a new school and a lot of our first year campers will be going to maybe a new middle school next year, they're going to be meeting new kids, but they're going to be apprehensive. What do I wear? What do I, you know, do? Am I going to know anybody? But they're going to get through it just like they're going to uh, get through that transition to camp. And if they have that experience of being successful in a new environment, that's going to serve them well. Again, not only when they go to a new middle school, a new high school, whatever they do for post-secondary education, whatever they do for their first job. I mean, having an experience where they have to uh, learn a new situation and experience something new is a great skill for kids to have. And if we can build it in a relative structured way with a lot of support from obviously the family but also the troop leader and the friends of the scout we can build that uh, feeling of accomplishment that hey I can do this that will help them in other transitions that they go through in life say Mike uh, I was just thinking I know that they're not supposed to have their phones in school but can you imagine if uh, if they could and anytime you're uncomfortable, give mom a call. And it's just, and it's, it's like my friend who went on the camp out in the boundary waters. It's like, you're going to be uncomfortable. If you have that phone at the ready, it was mom on speed dial. Um, you're never going to, you're never going to stretch your comfort zone and get the kind of growth that we know every parent wants for their child. Yeah. Perfect for sharing. And um, one of the things we do want to also highlight is a lot of this conversation has based off of you all sending your scouts to camp. First year, you get that anxiety. Um, fortunately, um, both Brian and I do have a solution where you could get the best of both worlds, and that's our family camp opportunities. Um, between Brian and I, we have around 27-ish cabins that can be rented any week um, throughout the summer where you could go up and join your scout. Um, you could be able to, you would be able to sit across the lake, um, enjoy all the amenities we have at both our family camp and family island um, opportunities, but then you would also get the time to go over. Um, I know that was something my troop used to do. One of our scout moms would stay in family camp and every morning would drive over to the scout side to spend time with her kids and with us as a unit. And that is always an opportunity and there's more information on the website. Um, but that's welcome to anybody, anyone, if you want to bring yourself, just your, uh, just you, your entire family, if you want to bring some friends, you can do whatever. And it's a great opportunity because they get that chance to, to go up to camp for that first time. And you get a chance to also go up and relax and see what they're doing and be able to check in with them um, throughout, throughout the week. Um, yeah. But I believe at that point, that is all of the um, Alex, questions. Um, oh. Sorry. I'll add a plug for that. Uh, my nephew uh, is a fifth grader going to Tomahawk for his first time this summer. And his parents are a little nervous about it and he's a little nervous. So I'm actually renting a family island cabin um, to hang out with his troop a little bit during the week that he's up. Um, and I'm excited. I haven't been to camp in a while. Um, and uh, one of the things I love about watching kids come home from camp is when they get camp sick. Um, instead of homesick. Um, and that happened to me when I went to camp as a sixth and seventh grader. I just missed camp and my friends so much. My parents didn't understand me the same way that my friends at camp did. And they didn't understand the things I did and the challenges. And um, I, once I started going to summer camp, I was hooked. And um, I've watched my nephew just even on little camp outs with his troop, just be like, he comes home with inside jokes, things that other scouts have said, um, admiration for the older boys in his troop. Um, and so 
that's like the best situation if when they come home, they just want to go back. And that it can be a challenge for a family to deal with when you've got a grumpy kid who wants to be at camp, but um, it means they had an awesome time. So um, that's just my plug for that as well. Um, we did get a couple questions in. So um, I'm going to answer the first one and then um, I will ask the panel, probably mostly staff, just to talk about the second one. Um, the first question relates to uh, an employee of many point that was arrested um, and officially charged and pleaded guilty to, to some sexual assault. And um, it's a terrible situation when it happens anywhere. Um, one child being abused is too many. Um, and uh, it's a really unfortunate situation, one that we've been aware of for a couple years. Um, and we want to clarify, though, that uh, that employee did not plead guilty or was not charged with anything related to actions at Many Point Scout Camp or any scouting activities. He abused children, youth at the school that he was a resource officer at. And we really believe that our strong protection policies that we hold both adults, volunteers, and our own staff to um, were the deterrent for that not happening on camp property or in scouting situations. So while we were very um, su just as surprised as everybody else that a police resource officer was capable of doing those things to youth, um, none of it happened at camp. Um, and we take our youth protection policies very seriously. We train our staff before they go to camp about it. We remind them when they get to camp. It's part of training pre and at camp staff training. Um, and all of our staff are looking out for it, for both volunteer leaders and each other. Um, us taking care of our own camp staff that are children um, is also really important to us because um, that's another thing that scouting does great is we give kids that are ready for it another opportunity to grow and learn by being on camp staff. Um, and that's the other great thing is there's going to be staff at these camps that are close to your campers age. Um, so it's not just all adult staff. There's other youth, um, older scouts that are on staff. And that's just really cool to see kids teaching kids, scouts teaching scouts. So um, I hope that that addressed that question. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, when things like that happen, it's definitely not what we want. Um, but we take it very seriously. And when anything is brought up to us that's suspicious um, or a problem, we talk to leaders, we talk to staff about it, um, we'll record it and make sure we have a record of it. Even if it's something as simple as a leader not following too deep leadership to walk a scout somewhere. Um, if a staff member sees it, they report it. And we talk to them about it and we record it because um, it might not be anything. They might have just made a mistake, um, but it also could be a habit. Um, and so uh, all of our staff are trained to keep an eye out for that and make sure that those policies are enforced every day. Um, and our commissioners, our camp directors, um, they're all looking for that with our leaders, too. Um, they're making sure that the units are following that. Um, and so our policies do work um, and they do go a long way to keep kids safe. Um, and we're committed to them uh, all summer long. So I hope that answers your question. Um, um, one thing to add to that, Catherine, just to yeah. kind of do the more in the live with many point. Um, we do make sure we have that too deep leadership followed everywhere. Um, Mike and I have been working very tirelessly since November to make sure all of our overnight programs have two 21 year olds. Um, this year for our all-star program, we have a male and female 21 year old in the site. Um, we don't necessarily rely on the adult leaders to provide that for us. And we wanna make sure our trained staff are doing that as well as all of my, all of my camp directors, all of my program directors, me, myself, uh, well, me and myself, uh, myself and Mike um, go through extensive training to make sure that we are, we're looking out for these things and that they don't happen. We also make it very strict. And um, last year, uh, well, even a couple of years ago, um, there were 16 year olds and 21 year olds riding in a car together. We don't, we make sure that doesn't happen anymore. We, we make sure we take down those, those things and create those barriers to protect not only all of your scouts and your youth that are coming to camp, but also our staff, our staff are all, we have a lot of youth on staff and we want to make sure we're protecting 
everybody that comes to camp. And scouting is really the safest place for, for kids to be and spend their time. And summer camp is no exception um, to that. And even when it comes to other emergency situations, uh, when it comes to weather, I know that's a big concern for a lot of people because our scouts spend the week outside, they're staying in tents. So what happens when there's severe weather? Well, it happens before there's severe weather. First off, we have lots of policies and procedures in place to follow. We are always monitoring the weather. And we look at the daily weather report. We've got weather radios everywhere. I sleep with one a foot and a half away from my head every single night. Uh, I check the weather every single night and we have multiple staff that do the same thing at both Tomahawk and Many Point. On the first day of camp, scouts will participate in a camp tour and an emergency drill to make sure that they all know where and when, what signals there are uh, that mean that they need to go to a storm shelter. Our storm shelters are concrete bunkers. Uh, they're very safe uh, in, in the case that there's high winds or tornadoes. Um, and the scouts are trained within the first 24 hours of being at camp as to where those are and when they need to go to those areas. Uh, we, as far as medical emergencies go, both of our properties have registered EMTs on staff. And every week we have volunteer doctors that take turn being the doctor for the week. Those doctors will host a sick call both in the morning and in the evening. So if a scout is feeling ill um, or if they, uh, if they do get an injury from wood carving or they, they, you know, they trip playing games with their friends, uh, they will go and see the doctor. And uh, most, most issues can be taken care of by the doctor. Sometimes there's, you know, situations of homesickness where a scout will go and be feigning some sort of, some, some sort of illness. They'll see the doctor. The doctor will be able to confirm that they're fine. Um, and then we can start our homesickness protocols to, um, to work through that. Um, we've got wildlife policies in place for making sure that everybody's trained on putting their smellables in the right spots so that we don't have issues with bears. We fog many of our tenting areas to uh, detract mosquitoes. We can't get them all, but we do uh, try to manage that as much as we possibly can. Uh, we've got procedures in place for fires and evacuations, uh, you know, active, active shooter threats, the, anything that you'd find at a school, we also have procedures for. Um, and, and we're constantly, um, as the professional camp directors here that work year round, we're constantly addressing new types of issues or emergencies that could come up. So, um, that active threat plan is kind of a newer one. And just today, Alex and I were testing out portable um, sirens and whistles to figure out the best way to like tell people about that kind of situation. So um, it's ever evolving um, and we're making sure that everyone is retrained every year in all of those procedures. And we have these procedures in place because it's, it's the best thing to do for our campers. Uh, in addition to that, we are assessed by the national organization. Teams of volunteers that are trained as assessment teams come out and they assess the, uh, uh, the standards that we're held to as a camp. So outside uh, volunteers, not part of Northern Star, come and they scrutinize all of our paperwork, our policies, our procedures. They check the certification levels and all the training dates of our staff. Um, so... We're, uphold, we're being upheld to a very large or high standard, and we as Northern Star go above and beyond that. And, and on top of that, um, not only is Many Point um, nationally recognized by the Boy Scouts, but uh, Many Point is one of only seven camps in the nation that is American Camp Association accredited, um, four of them being the high adventure properties. Um, so we, Many Point, um, we have a whole nother set of standards that we get to follow, um, and they believe it or not, are a lot more strict than the national standards are. So we we take that extra step going above and beyond. And um, we do everything. We have the even even Tomahawk, we we look at things and we have what the professionals are saying is the best thing to do at both of our properties. Um, Tomahawk does not doesn't hold the accreditation, but they still do a lot of the same things we do. 
Um, and that's just to make sure that we have that consistency across the properties and that we are doing what is the best for um, not only everyone on this call, but also every single person that steps foot on that property, whether it's our staff, our scouts, volunteers, families, we want to make sure it's the safest and the best for you all. Um, sort of related to health issues, uh, we got a question in, um, and I'll I'll kind of ask all three of you this question. Um, the first, maybe um, Mike or Brian or Alex can talk a little bit about how medications are handled in cooperation with the unit leader and um, the health staff, um, especially when a camper may have a medication that needs to be given multiple times a day. Um, so that's the first half of that question, and then I'll ask the second half. Okay, I can handle that one because uh, it's gone back and forth with Wisconsin state rules. But, uh, you know, your, your scouts are going on campouts on weekends with your troop. And on those weekends, if a parent isn't there, somebody at the troop level is managing those medications and they know your scout. They know your scout better than, than our staff probably do. And each troop is going to designate somebody throughout their week at camp to administer the medications to, to those scouts. They know you, they know the scouts, they've, um, you know, they have those medication bottles and those are stored in a secured location uh, with each unit. Uh, so those medications are very close to the unit and the scout can be given any medication that they need, whatever has been prescribed uh, at the intervals that they need it. So they won't need to go to some centralized building, stand in a large line while everybody else is doing you know, playing some game, uh, medication distribution fits in pretty seamlessly. And uh, maybe Myron or Renee can talk about how that has worked with their units and, and how they do that and works into um, their daily schedule. Yeah, uh, just as Brian said, uh, we have a, uh, a health officer within our troop. So there's an adult who's identified who has a, a first aid log, the first aid kit, and all of the medicine that, and for in our troop, that would all go in a Ziploc bag with each scout. There is a, a slip in each bag that tells them, uh, you know, here's here's what the medication is. Here's how often that scout receives it. More importantly, that that leader is going to have a conversation in that church parking lot before we leave with mom or dad, and you know, verbally get it the information. Oh, he takes this only if he needs it. Um, this one he takes every night before bedtime. Um, he's and uh, and learning the nuances of that scout. He's really good about it, or he needs to be reminded. Um, but that's something that that adult in our troop is administering them right in the campsite. Very often, it's just a few feet from his tent, um, and then. Uh, so it's always administered by an adult, and then it's also securely locked when they're not administering it. Yeah. Thank you. And with health forms, since we're on the topic of medications, as everybody comes into camp, the health forms are all filled out by parents. Those are reviewed by adult uh, by the adult leader in the troop that needs to know about those. And then that adult leader reviews those with our health director, that EMT that we mentioned earlier. And that EMT, as they're going through it, they flag any, any unusual thing that may be beyond, uh, needs a little bit more attention, uh, or where a staff member may need to be notified of that so that during that scout's merit badge, a staff member can uh, know about any conditions that need an extra attention uh, beforehand. So they fill out a health alert, and they administer that down to the program directors, and the program directors will share that information to the staff that need to know that. Um, and those medication forms and those health forms are uh, securely stored in our health offices with our volunteer doctors. And then uh, at many points, they're released at the end of the week at Tomahawk. We have to retain copies of those for state uh, for state policies in Wisconsin. So the, the, sec the second half of this question, um, I think the leaders here and our staff, we all know that um, anxiety, uh, learning disabilities, um, ADHD, other issues kids are dealing with from home or whatever can manifest at camp as disruptive behavior. Um, and uh, we've also at our camp seen more and more of that after the pandemic. Um, just kids aren't as you know, socially developed. They're not used to listening. They've been on screens for two years. Um, and so 
we definitely over the last couple summers at all of our camps have seen more and more kind of disruptive behavior from scout all type, you know, all scouts. And so maybe um, Mike could talk a little bit about how staff deal with that in like merit badge classes and staffed activities. And then maybe Marine or Myron can talk about how you deal with um, disruption, uh, be disruptive behavior in a way that honors the scout that's having the issue, but also doesn't ruin camp for everybody else. Sure, thank you. And again, when I'm working with teachers in schools, we say that the best classroom management is engaging instruction, right? And the same thing is true at camp. I mean, to have scouts actively engaged in what they're doing uh, is gonna solve a lot of the management or disruptive issues. The other thing is, uh, scouts generally want to be there. They're signing up for things that they want to do or their uh, advancement things that they want to do or troop activities that they want to do. And so we try to keep them as engaged as possible and structure activities so they're not just sitting around being bored or sitting around a picnic table listening, but they're actually actively engaged in learning. And that's that's good instruction and that's being a great staff member. So we at many point, we have a 10 days of staff training prior to the scouts getting there um, because we have we have staff members that are teachers in real life, as well as people that are first year, 16 year old uh, staff members that were, you know, just counselors in training last year. So we have a wide variety of different staff. And so it's important for us to go through training, uh, not only teaching them how to tie knots and sail sailboats and things like that, the technical skills, but also how to work with kids. So we do that during our staff training week. Additionally, we work, like I mentioned before, in our first class adventure program, we have the adults from the troop actively involved in working with the staff on the instruction. Because again, the more folks that know the, the scout, the more folks that have worked with the scout in the past, a lot of times they have strategies that have been successful in the troop. So again, active engaging instruction is our first kind of our uh, tier one intervention. If there's issues where a scout isn't able to concentrate or isn't able to focus. Um, that's where, in addition to our regular camp staff, we have uh, senior staff members, program directors, camp directors that have been on staff for a number of years. And a lot of times they're able to either work with a staff member or work with the scout to get them re-engaged. Again, our goal is to help the scout be successful and to help have them have fun and them be involved in the activity. If that's not possible, then we work with the adult leader. Again, as an adult leader in my own troop, we had um, some scouts that had no this issues at all. We had some scouts that had multiple issues, but we as troop leaders knew what those issues were. So again, as camp staff members, we're going to work with that troop leader and find out what strategies are we going to be able to do to make that uh, scout successful. So again, there's a lot of different avenues that we have, but it starts out with engaging active instruction, but then also that team approach, working between the staff members, the senior staff members, and the uh, adult leaders from the troop in order to help that scout be successful. Renee or Myron, anything to add to that? That was a very thorough answer, thank you. <laughs> I'll just say that, uh, you know, one of the things that, and, and I'm also an educator, and one of the things that we have at camp that we don't always have in the classroom is, the space for uh, someone who's who's having a behavioral issue to, to have some space, both for away from the group and space is something we have a lot of at camp. Um, I sometimes joke that uh, we have a, we have a we have a lot of program. And it's very intensive, but sometimes what a scout needs is just the opposite: is we the, we need to slow things down. And so this is when we switch into what I like to call the Tom Sawyer mode. Um, so instead of doing all the programming that might be stressing a scout out, how about we just hang out in the hammock, maybe do some fishing, you know, something that is a, a lot more slow down. And, uh, you know, in terms of bothering the other group, it's, it's all about finding a space that is right for that scout. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of space at camp. And so I, it's, it's, you're in the outdoors. So there's a lot of noise and a lot of racket and it's easy to just step away from it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, a couple other questions um, about food allergies, how we handle those, and then also EpiPens. Um, good questions there. 
Yeah, I can take care of that one. Um, so one of the new things just to kind of kick it off this year that we did is everyone on their registration. Um, it's now a required field to you for you to let us know what a di what dietary restrictions you may have. Um, as a whole, Camp Northern Star, we work strongly with um, five different um, dietary restrictions. And Brian, if I mess any of them up, um, just correct me. But we do um, gluten, vegetarian, um, dairy, and then, or is it just the four with religious pork? Yeah, we'll do a religious pork and all of our kitchens are peanut free. We don't yep. do any cooking. We don't handle peanuts. Uh, they don't enter our kitchen. Anytime uh, peanuts might be in an ingredient, it's either a peanut butter jar, which may be on a table and we do have peanut free tables um, or an item is individually wrapped and so sometimes some of our pre-wrapped cookies were manufactured in a place that had contained peanuts, but that's listed on the packaging. So the only peanuts that we work with are either peanut butter from the jar or individually wrapped identified items. Yeah, but overall within the properties themselves, we both Brian and I do have people whose dedicated job is to deal with dietary restrictions, um, whether it's in um, the dining hall or in the commissary. Um, we make sure these proper steps are taken um, and we go through the proper routes. Um, our menus have been built um, this year. Many pointedly, I know, is um, implementing dietary menus. So that way we just say, here's what you are getting on the menu. Um, and we, we do take that very seriously. Um, we want to make sure everyone gets the food and we try to keep actually the meals as close to the original meal as possible. So if you are getting spaghetti for dinner, um, the scout or the adult leader who has a gluten allergy will just get gluten-free pasta. Um, in the dining hall, it's cooked completely separately. Um, so that way there's no, there's no scout, um, uh, cross contamination. Scouts with an EpiPen. Um, typically, I know I've always said the scout should probably carry it with them. They're going to know how to use it. They're going to know when they're going to need it. At camp, we do have extra EpiPens on standby. Um, one of our doctors every year, thankfully this year, he secured um, some for each of the two properties to have and use if needed. Um, but we do ask the scout carries them with them. Um, it's no good if one of Renee's scouts walks away and then has to get stung by a bee. Um, Renee having the EpiPen isn't going to do any, any good. Um, but within the units, Renee, is there anything special that you do to try and help track it or take care of it? Um, we check in with the scout every day. Uh, that make sure that they, you know, they're carrying their EpiPen. Scouts can be forgetful sometimes, but that's not something we want them to forget. Um, also with the cross contamination, many units will have a separate cooking station so that there isn't any cross contamination if there's um at, at least at many point we have. campsite where um the staff or and the within the staff in the unit we can make sure that they're nice and clean that they're sanitized ready to go for that scout um just so we make sure we don't have that cross contamination throughout the week and while we were on the topic of epi pens in there any emergency medication should be carried on the scout's person so inhalers or any other type of emergency medication uh, should be with them at all times. Um, routine prescription medication would be locked up with a, with an adult leader. Mm -hmm. um, and it, sh it should also be noted that in our kitchen, even though we have separate prep areas, uh, they do share the same airspace. So people with really severe reactions to trace amounts uh, of items, there might be a grain of flour that works its way across the kitchen. Um, if that is, is something that... Uh, is of a concern for somebody because they'll have a severe reaction even to trace amounts of dairy or gluten. Um, we will create a space and allow people to bring their own food, uh, either prepared or ready to be prepared. And we will help them figure out how to store it at camp and how to access it. A lot of people will pre like kind of prep meals and we have access to microwaves or other ways to bring that food back up the temp. For anybody with complex allergies, or or severe sensitivities or just additional concerns um, and they'd feel more comfortable bringing their own food and they will receive a reduced rate in the fee for that 
All right. Well, that was the last of our typed questions. I'll just give a chance for anybody to raise their hand or unmute themselves if they have any last minute questions. Um, we are trying to just honor everyone's time and keep this as close to an hour as we can. Um, and uh, we just want to thank everybody for their time. We want to thank our expert panelists for their time as well. Um, and uh, we hope this did something to ease your fears. Um, if it doesn't help you send your kid to camp this summer, which we hope it did, um, maybe next summer, uh, maybe winter camp, uh, a camp out. Um, and uh, if you have more questions or other concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to Alex, Brian, myself. Um, if you have questions for the leaders here, we can get questions to them as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we're excited for camp. It's coming really soon. And uh, we're going to have a great summer at all our properties. And we hope that we see as many of your kids there as possible. Um, Alex put his contact info in the chat. Um, we can probably also email it out to everybody who signed up as well tomorrow. Um, a little follow-up. This has also been recorded. So um, we are going to be making this available to other people. If you have other parents um, or other folks in your units that maybe couldn't come tonight, but would like to see this, um, we'll make that available uh, early next week as well. So once again, thank you to everybody and uh, have a great evening and uh, see you all at camp. <laughs>